Okay, so the topic of this video is the energy that exists within an ecosystem. So let's get started. So when we begin our discussion, we should talk about the components of an ecosystem. Let's start with the producers. After all, they form the basis of the energy within an ecosystem. You know, this coral reef here is powered by the photosynthetic corals that you see. This particular wetland is powered by the photosynthetic plants that you see. Now this desert right here is powered by the photosynthetic plants. So let's start with the producers. So the producers are the autotrophs in an ecosystem, those that are able to perform photosynthesis in order to make sugars. You know, we need three basic ingredients, water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight in order for the autotrophs to do photosynthesis. And then they will produce some oxygen waste, but more importantly, they produce glucose. That's the prize of photosynthesis. That's why they're called producers. This glucose is the energy that they produced for the ecosystem. So a lesser known example of a producer are the chemotrophs. And, and these are the bacteria that actually feed upon the minerals being released out of the hydrothermal vents, like, like the ones you see in this picture. You see the smoke billowing out of the cracks. Well, uh, in that smoke are minerals that bacteria will feed upon, which they then are the basis of their ecosystems. But most of the time when we say producers, we're referring to the photosynthetic autotrophs, like plants. So also in an ecosystem are the consumers, the heterotrophs, those that actually consume and eat others for energy. You know, here's a list of some of the various types of consumers. You know, the lion here represents a carnivore as it's a meat eater. Here we have some elk grazing on grasses. Well, they're herbivores, they're plant eaters. You know, bears are kind of a classic example of an omnivore. Omnivores eat both plants and animals. Uh, later on, we'll talk to, about the detritivores and how they eat organic matter versus the saprophytes and how they absorb organic matter. So these are coming later on in the presentation. Okay, so now I want to talk about the trophic levels in an ecosystem or the feeding levels. Here you see a food chain with five feeding levels, five trophic levels. The plant is one, the grasshopper two, the mouse is three, the snake is four, the hawk is level five. And trophic levels show how organisms feed throughout an ecosystem. And so in this food chain, you can see a producer in the form of the tree, and you can see various consumers. Now, often in, in a food chain, decomposers are not diagrammed and illustrated, and I'll talk about why that is in a little bit, but sometimes you might see them. And one thing to mention is that when energy is passed from one trophic level to the next, it's actually passed at a fairly inefficient level, about 10%. So let's say here we have our producer, the tree, the, tree, the plant, and because it's the producer, it will produce 100% of the energy for this particular environment. But as the energy moves from the plant to the grasshopper, because the grasshopper is consuming leaves and fruits from the plant, it's estimated that only about 10% of the energy level moves up to the next trophic level. So when the mice come along and eat the grasshoppers, they only get about 10% of what the grasshoppers had, which is 1% of what the plant made. And now when we go to the snake, only about 0.1% of the energy that was created by the plant ever makes its way to the snake. And when we get to the hawk, it's even less. 0.01% of the energy that the plants made will trickle upward to the hawk. So you can see energy is passed at a pretty inefficient level. Well, where did the other 90% of the energy go? Well, it's used by the organism while they're alive. And quite often in warm-blooded animals, it's, it's lost as heat. But this is why energy is passed at a pretty inefficient level, only about 10%. And so this is also, also explains why a food chain will typically only have four, five, six trophic levels. It's very rare to see a food chain with seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 trophic levels because when you get to the top, there's often there's not enough energy to sustain the organism at the top. You know, if I ask you this question, why are there fewer hawks in a forest than the number of grasshoppers? Well, this picture, this diagram here shows it nicely, I think. There's just not enough energy 
to sustain a large population of hawks compared to the grasshoppers. The grasshoppers are lower on the food chain, so they have more energy available to themselves. So let's look at food chains in a little more detail. Starting at the bottom, we have the first trophic level, which is going to be a producer of some kind. Now, typically, we're going to talk about the autotrophs that perform photosynthesis. They use carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight to produce sugars like glucose. And so when we say that these are at the bottom of the food chain, please do not misinterpret that and think that, oh, they're at the bottom, they're not important. It's the exact opposite. They are the most important trophic level in a food chain because they're the foundation. They produce all the energy that the life above them depends upon. And so typically these will be plants, the most common everyday type of producer that we think of, but they're not the only one. You know, apple trees are, you know, a pretty common plant that produces energy for the ecosystem. But there's also algae that, you know, live in ponds and rivers and lakes and streams, and they do photosynthesis. And here we have ocean kelp, a kelp forest that does photosynthesis. And even some types of bacteria are green and will do photosynthesis in their environments. And so these are the producers, the photosynthetic autotrophs. When we move up to the second trophic level, we call these the primary consumers. So be careful. It's trophic level number two, but consumer number one, because when we look at the first trophic level, that's a producer. So now we've come to the first consumer. And like the, like the diagram shows, these are the consumers that feed upon the lower level, which would be the plants, the producers. And so these are typically called the herbivores in a, uh, in a food chain. You know, here we have a mouse that is eating seeds. You know, a great example of an herbivore. Here we have elk grazing on grasses. Again, good example of the elk being herbivores. And lastly, here we have squir a squirrel feeding upon nuts from a tree. So again, these are good examples of, of primary consumers or also herbivores. Okay, so when we move up to the next trophic level, the third overall trophic level, we come to the secondary consumer. It's the second consumer, even though it's the third overall level. And like the name implies, and like the diagram implies, the secondary consumer will feed upon the level beneath them, the primary consumers. So at this level, we start to see the introduction of omnivores into the food chain. Omnivores are animals that will eat both plants and animals. And we also see some small carnivores at this point in the food chain as well. So here we have, for instance, a spider eating an insect. Here we have, for example, a, a duck, you know, eating a frog. You know, here we have another example of, you know, pretty low on the food chain of a, a larger lizard eating a smaller lizard. So we have examples of carnivores and examples of omnivores at this point in the food chain. Well, as we come to the fourth trophic level, these, this would be the third consumer, and the word for third is tertiary. So now we have the third consumer, the tertiary consumer, feeding upon the level beneath it, which would be the secondary consumers. As we get higher and higher on the food chain, this is where we start to see, you know, the larger carnivores, the larger omnivores in, uh, in an environment. So maybe, again, we have a snake eating a mouse. You know, be a pretty, you know, pretty straightforward example. Or in this case, we have a duck eating a fish. You know, we saw a moment ago a duck eating a frog, duck eating a fish. We're getting higher on the food chain. Uh, here we have a heron, which is a type of bird, eating a snake. So a snake itself can be fed upon by even larger animals within the food chain. And when we get to the fifth trophic level, the, the quaternary consumer. Quaternary is a word that means the fourth consumer. And so it feeds on the level beneath it. So the fourth consumer feeds upon the third consumer. And at this point in the food chain, again, we're pretty much looking at the top carnivores, the top omnivores within an ecosystem. These are what we call the apex predators. These are the predators that really don't have any predators themselves. And so, for instance, a wolf eating a rodent. There's really not much that hunts the wolf unless you count humans. When we look at, for instance, the bear, again, there's really not much that hunts the bear unless we add humans to this 
And lastly, again, a lion eating a buffalo. You know, the lions are pretty much at the top of the food chain in their particular environment. These would be examples of the apex predators. So when we look at this particular food chain, if I were to give you this picture and ask you what's wrong with this food chain, well, I hope you realize the arrows are pointing in the wrong direction. It should look like this. And the reason we have the arrows point in this direction, if, it, if I didn't make it clear earlier, I definitely want to stress it now, the arrows are supposed to show the direction that energy flows. The reason the arrow is going from the mouse to the snake, because energy that was in the mouse's body is being transferred to the snake, and that happens whenever the snake eats the mouse. So make sure you guys are aware of which direction uh, the arrow is pointing. It's pointing in the direction that energy will flow. Okay, we, uh, we talked about decomposers briefly at the beginning, and, and one thing to mention, decomposers are, are rarely shown on a food chain. If I were to add a, a mushroom at the very end of this food chain, you know, right above the hawk, that might give the wrong impression that, you know, the, the mushroom hunts a hawk, and, and obviously that's not the case. But the reason we don't often show decomposers is because they really will feed on any trophic level when that organism dies. If I add, for instance, some mushrooms over here, if I were to add the decomposers, then I would have lines going from every organism over to the decomposers. Because when mice die, their remains are fed upon by the mushrooms. When the grasshopper dies, its remains are fed upon by the mushrooms and the other decomposers. And not just the dead or other dead bodies, but also maybe their waste, their feces may be fed upon by decomposing bacteria and decomposing fungus. And so I want to mention the difference between the detritivores and the saprophytes. First of all, let's focus on the detritivores. You know, this vulture right here is a good example of a detritivore because it will actually ingest and take bites out of and feed upon dead matter like this dead skunk right here. It's feeding on the dead remains. Same with this dung beetle here. The, the beetle here is feeding upon the remains of, in this case, the poop from some other animal. But notice that detritivores actually ingest. They take into their body with their mouth and, and they have a digestive tract and they internally break down the food when it's in their stomach. And those are the detritivores. And that's different from the saprophytes. Mushrooms and bacteria are good examples of saprophytes because they release enzymes onto whatever they are living upon. They will absorb nutrients from, let's say, dead leaves or dead branches or even a, a dead organism itself. And they will release enzymes to externally digest whatever it is they are growing upon. Here we have some mold that is absorbing nutrients from the fruit. So again, what the, the, the saprophytes do is they externally digest. They release enzymes onto the outside of their bodies. And these enzymes will break down whatever they are growing upon, and then they can absorb the nutrients through their cells. And that's how they, they end up feeding themselves. But they're both types of decomposers. It's just how they decompose is different from one another. Okay, if we focus on food webs, you know, here we have a good example of a food web. It's a group of interrelated food chains. You know, within this one single food web, there are probably dozens of different pathways you could follow. Each pathway would be a food chain. For instance, I've highlighted this particular food chain, uh, which is four trophic levels. Level one would be the grass, level two would be the grasshopper, level three the blue jay, and level four the hawk. Here we have one food chain mixed into this food web. Here we have another food chain of five, uh, or excuse me, six trophic levels. Level one would be the grass, number two the grasshopper, number three the spider, number four the squirrel, number five the owl, number six the hawk. Here we have a, a completely different food chain mixed into this food web. And one more. Here we have another food chain highlighted in red of six trophic levels. The acorns level one, the grasshopper level two, the spider level three, the blue jay level four, the cat level five, the hawk level six. There's easily a few 
dozen pathways we could take within this one single food web. But these are a lot more realistic than a food chain, and the reason they're just more realistic is because they show all the feeding relationships in a community, not just, um, not just one sing single pathway. In reality, animals may feed upon many different kinds of prey, not just one like is depicted in a food chain. Well, if I were to uh, ask you to highlight a food chain from this food web, and then label each of the trophic levels. You know, that's something that, you know, for instance, here we might have this. From beginning to end, starting with a producer and going until there are no more arrows. Here we have a food chain made up of five trophic levels. And then labeling them, I would label the acorns, the producers. The grasshopper would be the primary consumer. The spider would be the secondary consumer. The squirrel would be the tertiary consumer and the hawk would be the quaternary consumer, using the vocabulary words that we brought up earlier. And one last question, you know, what might happen if a pesticide was used that killed all the grasshoppers in this particular community? What side effects or consequences might that have? Well, you might start to see grass overgrowth, since there's no more grasshoppers to keep the grass under control. You might see the slow death of spiders, after all, they lost their food source. You might start to see a decline within the blue jays. The blue jays used to feed upon the grasshoppers, and because the spiders are declining, the blue jays are in trouble for food. You actually might see the hawks having to hunt more squirrels. After all, if the blue jays are starting to, de to decline, they have to find food elsewhere. So the point is, you can see how everything fits neatly within this particular community. And life exists within, within a balance within our food web. If organisms are added and removed, that disrupts the balance that exists within nature. And so there you have it, energy within the ecosystems. You know, if you're in my biology class, try answering these eight questions on a separate sheet of paper. Bring me your answers before school or after school. I'd love to check them for accuracy. Thanks for watching.